History was made on February the 18th, 1956, when independent television went into homes in the Midlands for the first time. On this day, February the 18th in 1925, the first aerials in the world were picking up the first broadcasts ever made, and technicians were sending the first sound pictures through strange devices from a corner of their primitive control room into a primitive receiving set. As the artist spoke with face pressed close to the window of the soundproof camera room, the picture was transmitted from one room to another. Only a brief distance, but television was born. The first flashes had carried a picture across a few yards that would one day be widened into the vast distances of space. These were the years of new ideas, the years of the gay 20s. Too gay, some people thought, and devised the buffer belt to keep the dancing partner at a decorous distance. A device that might have been useful in this kind of jam session when the crowds danced in the streets and crushed around the procession for the students' rag in Birmingham. But life wasn't all fun in those post-war years. On this day in 1924, people in the Midlands were still suffering from the shock and disorder of the rail strike. 39,000 engine men had been out on strike. Industry throughout the country suffered. Passenger trains for London and Midland towns were stationary in the strangely quiet yards. engine drivers had to travel by bus, smiling cheerfully as they were encouraged in their stand for higher wages by their trades union leader. For eight days, the railways were paralyzed, the railwaymen idle. And if the lines aren't being used for anything better, why not wrap a length of them around your head? Birmingham firemen anyway didn't believe in inactivity and gave a display of lightning speed. Release the fire escape, run out the escape ladder, up with the hose, bring out the hand ladder, up again. With the help of the 1920s film camera, they beat all records. pace in politics was terrific too. Within two months, two men had gone to Buckingham Palace as Prime Minister. On this day in 1924, the whole country was still rejoicing, or raging according to their views, over the formation of the first Labour government. Mr Ramsay MacDonald visited Buckingham Palace after Mr Baldwin resigned in January and was invited by the King to form a new cabinet. Crowds gathered round the palace to see the new ministers come and go. And on this day in the 20s, many new faces and new names were coming into the world political picture. Kleins, Henderson, Philip Snowden, J.H. Thomas. Men who were to become famous in the history of the Labour Party under the leadership of Ramsay MacDonald. Arthur Henderson, one of the best known of this new cabinet, was elected for Burnley by a majority of over 7,000. Mr. Henderson was to become, in turn, Home Secretary, Chancellor and Foreign Secretary. Mr. Camps, the Conservative candidate, traditionally honours the victory of the best man. On this day in 1925, many people in the Midlands were discussing Birmingham's Great Hall of Memory, soon to be opened by Prince Arthur of Connaught. It was a magnificent memorial to the men and women who served in the First World War. 
symbolized by these four bronze figures designed by a Birmingham man, Mr. Alfred Tost. One of the heroes of this war, Admiral of the Fleet, Earl Jellicoe, had come to Birmingham not long before and was given a traditional reception by the naval ratings who had fought under his command. He opened a club for ex-sailors and here he is inspecting naval troops. In 1929, the distinguished visitors of the year to the Midlands were the Duke and Duchess of York who opened the great new generating station at Coles Hill. This power plant, costing over three million pounds, was designed to supply a wide area of the Midlands, covering places as far apart as Leicester and Nottingham, Derby, Warwick and Burton-on-Trent. started one of the large turbo alternator sets and congratulated all those responsible for this great achievement. On this day in 1927, Birmingham was preparing for the visit of the Prince of Wales to the British Industries Fair, where he was greeted by high officials of the city. And on this day in 1925, the silversmiths of Birmingham were finishing the Grand National Trophy, a magnificent example of the craft for which this city is world famous. Another sporting event of a special interest to the skilled workers of the Midlands was Major Seagrave's attempt on the world land speed record. As Major Seagrave tries her out, his famous car looks like the glittering space car of some future age. It hardly seems possible that it was constructed in Wolverhampton in the 20s. But it was not until February 1929 that the news of Major Seagrave's record run of 180 miles an hour at Daytona Beach reached the men who had made the car and the men who had packed her with such care for the long journey to America. In the news always were the fashions of this day and age. A brocade coat with fur trimming for smart evenings out and about. There was no Dior to think of H lines and A lines but the 20s had clothes lines just the same. The Ella Grin line for sophisticated glamour. unrevealing hat with what might be called a loose-fitting suit, elegant when correctly adjusted. Jewel-embroidered blouse and skirt with the old look. Up to the head, 
Even the woman seven feet tall could look smart in the 20s. And in spite of the long skirt handicap, Mrs. Goodyear won the Ladies' Golf Championship in the Midlands in 1921. Sport and athletics were as popular in the Midlands and North in the 20s as they are today. And there were plenty of competitors for the walking contest from Nottingham to Birmingham in 1925. And for this junior road walking championship in 1921. It was held in Manchester. I wonder how many of these boys, who must be in their 50s now, could still do 25 miles at this pace. Pace and tactics on the football field may not have changed much since this day back in the 20s, but you can see the influence of the ladies' low waistlines even in these all-male scenes. Newcastle is playing Manchester City in 1924. Free kick, and a goal. And now Aston Villa against Burnley, also in Watch them carefully and you'll be able to compare the football of 1924 with the game as it's played today when you see the big games on your television screen.